Hi, and welcome to the Green Nurse Podcast, an unfiltered discussion related to health and healthcare. My name is Amy. And my name is Sarah. And we are your podcast hosts. So just remember, we have our Gritty Nurse apparel line. Go to grittynurse.com to subscribe and get yourself some great swag. And we also want to let all of our listeners know that we have a Patreon account. You can find us on patreon.com slash grittynurse. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Amazon, or any other podcast platform, just be sure to hit subscribe so you can get a notification every time we have a new episode. Also, don't forget to rate and review us. Hey, rock stars! I wanted to take this opportunity to bring two amazing nurses and also nurse leaders uh, to have a conversation with us about life what life is really like. I mean, some of you who watch this YouTube channel and and watch these vlogs, you know what it's like because you are living the response to COVID every single day. And for many of us, we're curious, like what is it like for nurses, for leaders in healthcare right now? So we have the opportunity to talk with Sarah and Amy who are at the front line of this as nurse leaders and also of course, working with nurses and healthcare practitioners every single day. And side note, they have an awesome podcast, Gritty Nurse Podcast. So you'll probably want to check that out too. Ladies, thank you so much for spending time with us. I know you're super busy. Busy might be the understatement of the year. <laughs> thank you so yeah, much. Seriously. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, could you imagine this time last year that we would be having a conversation about this global pandemic? Mm-hmm. It's actually kind of crazy because, um, you know, this year, the year 2020 is supposed to be the year of the nurse and midwife. And wow, what a year it's been. We did not expect so many highs and lows and so many challenges. And I think it's really just been eye opening. Like if I thought this time last year, we would have a global pandemic that has shut everything down that, you know, over a million people have passed away from, including 1500 nurses this would have been something out of a science fiction movie. So I don't even know where to begin from where we were last year. Yeah, it seems like it's really right out of the twilight zone. I mean, I think um, nurses have always been hailed as being heroes and healthcare heroes. And I think really this year, we really need to recognize nurses. Like I think, and even just in frontline staff, like I think this year has been so challenging with COVID-19, with a variety of different things that have um, that have impacted and infected healthcare. So I so I still believe it's the year of the nurse, and I think we still need to kind of really talk about some of the things that mean the most to us as nurses as well. Yeah, and that's really what inspired me to write Rockstar is that I'm, I you know I feel like we as much as we recognize how important nurses are, we sometimes also just expect they're always going to be there. I mean, when you gave that chilling statistic right now, Amy, about how 1500 nurses have been lost due to COVID. I mean, this is not really the kind of thing that's getting much publicity. It's kind of like the global numbers in general. And probably a lot of us expect just like nurses will always be there. There's, we know that there's some inherent risk, but how many members of the public do you think really understand just how much risk on the short term, but also on the long term of doing shift work, the impact that makes to people's health? I mean, you mm-hmm. know, what is the real story about, about the risks that nurses take on every single day, pandemic or not? Well, I kind of like to put it from the perspective of other um, industries, right? So let's say you're a construction worker. You would not dream about going to the job site without your hard hat and your boots, right? And if you put that into the perspective of frontline workers, um, you know, you have to have the right PPE going into the situation to protect yourself. But often we don't have that PPE. So it's akin to like going into a construction site and there's work going on overhead and you don't have your hard hat Mm -hmm. and you're being told that that's okay. You know, you got to make do with what you have. And I don't think people realize that the statistics of nurse injuries on the job are actually much higher than other industries, such as construction and things that you would perceive to be risky, but we take on those risks every single day. And, you know, violence from patients, there's infectious diseases, lack of appropriate PPE, um, nurse on nurse violence, like there's all different things that we deal with on a daily basis that I'm not sure the general public is aware of. Of course, nurses are aware of it, but it's been something that's ongoing for a long time. And it wasn't until COVID that it really um, pulled the curtain back, at least on the um, PPE situation, that I think people really need to understand that 
We take a risk every single day that we look after patients, but we also worry when we go home to our families, like what if I have COVID? Do I need to stay away from my own family? Like, like how does that sort of play out? So it's been really challenging, I think, on that aspect. And if I could jump in there too, I think the other aspect that people don't recognize nor appreciate is nursing burnout has been a conversation that we've been long, like long standing, have been having. And I think people don't realize how, like, what it actually means for a nurse to be burnt out. And I think as much as we have COVID, we still have all of the other things that we have to continue to do. So yes, we have our COVID patients, but there might be initiatives that are happening. There might be other things that are happening within the organization. I think it's just, it's a compounding effect. And I think COVID is actually really breaking the backs of nurses right now. I think we don't feel that we have the support, whether it's through governmental, whether it's through our hospitals or organizations. I feel a lot of us feel that we are, as much as it's the year of the nurse and we're supposed to be celebrated and, and we hear a lot about this healthcare hero aspect, we don't feel like that. We don't feel, we don't, that is not the pulse of nursing right now. Right now, we are concerned about our own well being. Yes, we're concerned about the patients and their families, but I think this is a, a really critical time to really look at, do we have the mental health supports that we need in place? Do we have the equipment, like Sarah was saying, in place? And and really, there's a lot of things that are happening at the government level where it really doesn't show a greater appreciation. I think one of the things that we've mentioned um, right here in Ontario, when uh, our collective agreement has actually been imp uh, impinged upon where we actually can't bargain the way that we'd like to because there's a law that came into place that actually stopped nurses from being able to um, collectively to, t to change the way that we're actually being paid. And I think really um, the Ford government has actually only given nurses a 0.9% increase in, in our overall wages. And we see that as a huge problem. So I know a lot of nurses, whether it's Ontario Nurses for Change, as well as ONA, I don't know if you've seen some of those campaigns where we're not feeling that we're hailed as heroes. And I think we really want the general public to know that there's a lot happening in the background and we really need to speak up and stand up for ourselves. So what can the average person do to make sure that it doesn't feel like lip service? You use the hashtag, you know, thank healthcare heroes and that's it. I My job is done. What can every single one of us do that would make a nurse, nurses in general, like the broader profession, feel like we hear you, we appreciate you, we, we, we may not get everything that you're going through. However, we really wanna understand and empathize. What's our job? That is a good question. I think the first thing that nurses or um, the general public should do is um, find out who your MPP is in your local area. and find out where they stand on issues because there have been MPPs that have voted down bills that would have really helped nurses. Um, they have voted for bills that cap the wages of nurses, um, you know, for the next three years because we're um, funded by the provincial government. And it's just a slap in the face because there are many other professions, namely uh, police, firefighters, physicians, that are male dominated that have been able to, um, you know, get their yearly increases. And we're stuck at this increase, which feels like a slap in the face because we're being hailed as healthcare heroes, but then our wages are capped and they're not even being kept up with the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it doesn't make sense to us. And so I think the main thing is to really just be more um, aware of what's happening politically. And, you know, there's strength in numbers. So if enough people write to their MPP and say that they don't support bills that are harmful to healthcare workers, then that might be a first step. Okay. Absolutely. I completely agree. I think being informed and understanding what's happening is really important and getting involved politically. Like I think there, like I, and on terribly, there's over 80,000 nurses. I, I mean, I think we have a strong voice and I feel that our voice is still not being heard. And I don't know if it's because we're women dominated. I really hope that that's not the case. But like Sarah said, I think the, what the average person can do is reach out to their local MVPs. They can, they can raise their voices through social media. They can raise their voices through their own various different platforms. I think we do need to have a united front and to understand and really get them to understand what the problem is by doing a little bit of background and research as well. Yeah. yeah and just one thing I wanted to mention is that there was something that came out recently from um, a nurses union. And I guess in one of the larger hospitals in Ontario, they are no longer paying part-time nurses if they test COVID positive. 
So I'm not sure no. people are aware of that. So let's say you're a part-time nurse, you know, you're working three or four days a week. So you're not full-time. You don't, you don't actually get paid vacation or days off. You get paid of in lieu, but let's say you've gone to get a COVID test because you've been exposed to potentially a COVID positive patient. And now you're told that you're COVID positive. Mm -hmm. So not only can you not work, you're not even getting paid for your sick days. You've been told to apply now for subsidy, which you may not qualify for because your income is too high. And even mm -hmm. if you do qualify, you're gonna be making something like um, 500 bucks a week, which is nowhere near your normal salary. So like talk about ironic, it's like, I feel like this may cause people to not get tested or not be truthful because they need to make a living and support their families. Well, and the other, you know, reality that I think a lot of people who are outside of healthcare may not realize is that we are dependent on part-time casual nurses to be able to fill Absolutely. The gaps in the schedule. Yes. So it's not like, well, the solution is, well, then everybody should be full-time because that's going to be really tricky to fill a 24 seven organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Every, every nurse knows that, you know, we're always short every shift. People may not be aware of that in the general public, but it's really these part-time and casual workers that keep the units going and keep everything afloat. Yeah. But again, this is where I say we need to kind of get to the bottom of the problem, right? We understand that this nursing burnout thing is real, right? And I mean, I've done some research and looking at in terms of what nurses have available to them for support. And it varies across each different sector or wherever they're hired. Like, I mean, one of the things I've seen is some organizations offer EAP. So most organizations have EAP, but it's not going to really extend far enough for them to get the support that they might need in the time or, or various different organizations have, have like manual life or various different plans where let's say the benefits are $500 for mental health support, that's not going to be enough to get nurses or other healthcare professionals through this pandemic. I it, I feel like we're being shortchanged at every avenue. And what's going to happen when a nurse is not able to, to go into work, they're going to call in sick, you're going to see your sick time increase, you're going to see um, your, and I mean, like, it, it, it's also it affects the staff, it affects the patients, there's a whole trickle down effect. So I think we need to really look into how we can treat nursing better. Yeah. And so tell us more for those of us who are not in a hospital or a long-term care, you know, home or, or the many other home care, the many other places that we depend on nurses to be through us anytime, particularly during COVID, what does burnout look like? How, how does it manifest itself in the profession and, and help us, you know, if you can put it into our experience so that we can really get as best as we can, what that may look like and the, and how challenging that is to live with that day in, day out. Right, right. Mm. So I, from my own perspective as a nurse who's experienced burnout, I think it really starts with actually something very simple, just as like sleep. Maybe you're having difficulty sleeping, right? Maybe it's just that that you're feeling that you're you're not well rested, you're going into work and you're starting to feel that, that you know, um, you're, you're feeling changes within your own self. So you're tired, you're, you're stressed about going into work, maybe you don't feel like going into work. And maybe even just the job itself, you just don't feel that passion anymore. So yes, we, we talk about nursing as a career that people get into because they have a passion to care for others. I completely wholeheartedly agree with that. But I think what you can start seeing is some of the subtle signs is that day-to-day -day getting up is really a struggle. Going in to do your shift is a struggle. Every time you go in, it's not, it's not, you're not positive about being there. You, all you feel and all you say and all you exude is negative um, emotions and feelings. So some of it is just some of that, that beginning psychological aspect. And then sometimes it can be also physical as well. So I don't know if Sarah, you want to jump in and talk about some of the physical effects of burnout? Yeah, I think, um, well, the physical effects might be you know you don't have much of an appetite you don't feel like eating or you're overeating so so either one of those extremes is concerning um 
I think back pain is ubiquitous in nursing. So mm -hmm. um, nurses who have been working for years often have back pain. They've got bad knees. They might have bad shoulders. And what you as a patient might notice is a, a nurse that really is not able to be there with you in the moment. So they're rushing around. It feels like they're not able to spend the time with you because they're overworked. Um, you know, people have called in sick. Their colleagues have called in sick. So they're, they're forced to take on more patients uh, than they're able to effectively. And then you might also notice a lot of um, changes in your team. So you might not ever get the same nurse at the same time. It's because they can't give you the same nurse. That nurse has called in sick or there's another sicker patient that they need to look after. So you might just notice um, care that is disjointed and not for the fault of the nurse. Or you might think that I have told somebody that, um, you know, my preference is five times already. And they didn't hear me. Well, I think they did hear you, but it's just that the unit is so chaotic. They're not able to um, communicate that message effectively. Yeah. And I guess that's where also you can see mistakes happening, right? I mean, if you're tired, you're overworked, you, your, your ratios are off. So your, your, your patient to staff race ratios are off. That's where we can think. Sarah, can you tell us about the nurse patient ratio when they're off? Um, so, so the nurse patient ratio, uh, it's different on every unit, of course. So usually during the day, it's lower than at night. But I think what Amy was saying is the more that your patient ratio increases beyond what is safe, that's when errors start to occur. And really, we're, we're not machines, right? We're humans. So there's only so many patients we can effectively safely look after before things start to happen. And there's been research to back that up as well. So really, it's just, um, it's a symptom of the root cause, right? Which is just that we, um, the working conditions that nurses experience, we're not able to maintain the number of nurses we need. So even before the pandemic, you know, nurses have always been at a shortage. And I think this is just compounding the issues. So the ultimate, I think, in um, or in employers' um, view, their point of view, the ultimate worst case scenario is that a nurse gets so burnt out that she leaves the profession and he or she leaves that profession entirely. And then you've yeah. permanently lost someone. So it's yeah. not that someone has taken a leave of absence. It's not that they've gone from full-time to part-time, but they have just decided to leave altogether. And I can see that when this pandemic is over or maybe even right now, nurses are probably leaving in record numbers. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really concerning in terms of recruiting new people to the profession that maybe people are thinking twice now about applying to nursing school because of all the things that they've heard. And I can imagine what a pressure you feel as nurse leaders that, you know, you want to do something, you want to stop that potential revolving door, that you want to reduce sick time, you want to make sure that you could do whatever you can to reduce burnout. And yet I'm, I'm guessing that probably your ability to um, impact that, the, you know, to the extent that you'd like to is hindered. I, I can remember when in my last job, anytime we had an issue at senior team that we didn't know the answer to, I'd spend Friday, either half of the day or a full day shadowing whatever provider had an insight, a window into that. And I really look forward to my Fridays because it kind of gave me a sense of what's really going on in the organization. Mm -hmm. And then I could come back better informed to the next to our Tuesday um, meetings. But, you know, has that that has that sort of visibility? Have you been able to be there and as physically with people as much during COVID? And how what else has been impacted for you as leaders in trying to be the type of leaders that you want to be for nurses right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what we try to do as much as we can is use our voice, right? I think um, that's the reason why we have our podcast, the Gritty Nurse Podcast, as well as we have our apparel line. Like, I think, I think we have as much as we can't be out there as much as we'd like to on the front lines. I think it's important to continue to use our voice. So, one of the things that I love to say as when I used to be a nursing educator is go into the Gemba, go into the heart of where the action is. And I know with COVID, it's really made that really hard, but I really think it's super important. I'm so glad that you said this, Sarah, that it's really important that people go, go out and see, you can't, you can't make decisions from the top. If you're not involved actively with the people who are on the ground doing the work, you have to get in to go and see. And we continually have conversations with nurses, whether it's online, whether it's through our podcast, talking about the things that really mean the most to, to nursing and healthcare. So I think if, if we can, if we can urge um, people that are in these senior and executives roles, 
please go to your front line and ask those questions. They they are the ones that'll tell you what is what, what is what and what's actually happening. And if you don't get that pulse, you're never going to get the right answer. Right. And don't be afraid to go just because you might hear something you don't want to hear because a complaint's simply a poorly worded request. So if nurses right. are really stressed or overwhelmed or busy, it's it's there if it, even if it's intense that feedback that you're receiving, it's it's there you know they're asking for something. They're trying to help you understand. They're not trying to, you know, like here you go it's your problem now. It's just like, I don't know how better sometimes to explain. I would, I would imagine that that's, you know. Yeah. And I think, I think people that are engaged will give you that strong feedback, whether it's positive or negative, it's better to have someone engaged than Mm -hmm. someone that's totally checked out because at least, you know, they can be part of the solution if you work with them. And one thing I would say to senior leaders is that if you can engage your frontline in some way, you'll have much better buy-in to whatever initiative you're working on. And it will just go that much better for you just to really be with them and not, you know, sit up in your office all day. You really need to connect with your frontline staff. And I think one of the things is it can't be like a one time touch base because that happens, right? And, and nurses, we can see through it, we can see through all of that nonsense. So if you come down one time and ask a question once, and then we never see you for months to come, we can see through that we know that you don't really care about it. So I think if you're going to make those touch bases, they need to be, they need to be authentic, we need to know that you actually care. And then you have to take the accountability to do something with it. So we've given you this information. We've said, hey, this is how you can best help us do something about it. Please, please. I think nurses, this is where you hear nurses say all the time, it doesn't matter if we speak out because nobody is listening. I'm telling you, you have to do something. You have to action it. You can't come down and say, speak to us and then just don't do anything about it. Because nurses are sick of having these conversations, saying the same thing over again, and not seeing results. We want to see results. We want to see change. And one of the things, again, I think that um, people from outside of the healthcare system don't realize is that different people are paid in different ways. So physicians are independent contractors, and depending on what type of specialty, you have different compensation structures and models and hours of working and that, you know, hospitals are responsible for giving physicians privileges and yet also don't have a ton of control over their accountability, nurses and other providers, environmental services aides and so forth. They're hired by your organization. However, you as leaders may inherit folks and it's you've got to sort of work within your own collective agreement to make sure that you follow all the rules for scheduling for you know making sure people are aligned in the right rules there's different levels of specialization of nurses and so it's not like you can just say oh there's a gap over here just you know send folks over here you have certain criteria that you need to make sure so that people are have the skills and the expertise and this is I think one of the greatest mysteries we need to to help people realize is that some of those some of those um in inherent challenges of running one of the most complex organizations the healthcare they arguably say is one of the most complex organizations to run there's a lot of inherent challenges built in just by nature of trying to provide great care and that can't be a reason not to focus on the individual provider experience right. so you know to focus on quick wins and that that patients and families and also partners in the community can have an impact on those little tiny micro moments to make uh, nurses remember why they got into the profession, that they're valued. I mean, you know, my brand forever recognize others greatness. How can individuals, the individual nurse educator, nurse leader, the community partner, the mayor, the patient, how can people demonstrate in quick wins true, authentic, quick wins that they forever recognize others, nurses, greatness. Any suggestions? That's such, such a difficult question, but such a powerful question that needs to be answered. And I think that is through helping, knowing that we need to know that people stand with us. And I think what we're afraid of is actually speaking about the things that that affect us. Cause I think we, we as nurses are so concerned about the other, right? We, we are always forever caring about other people mm-hmm. to the detriment sometimes of ourselves. Right. So we're, we, as nurses, we can't strike. We can't, we can't have lockouts. We can't have those types of um, avenues where we can say, Hey, you know what? Nobody is listening to us. But I think what we want is we just want to know that it's safe 
to say what is on our mind. It is safe to say what is affecting us and for people to stand with us to say, absolutely, it's okay to say those things. How do how do we ask the general public or just anybody to do that? I think that is through, um, I think that's such a difficult question. I think it's just through, like I know we've had people banging pots and pans. We, we appreciate that, but I think we need to mobilize a different form of action. Um, can they contact their MVP? Yes, that's just something that an everyday person can do to say, hey, you know what, we've heard the nurses' plates and we're seeing that things at the governmental level are not wor wor working in their favor for them. I think that's one of the small things that people can do. You can write a letter to your administrator or your, your hospital organizations to say, hey, I'm seeing that this is happening in um, politically to nurses. This is what, these are some of the smaller things that I feel that people can do. It's great that we have people that are banging pots and pans and, and saying, hey, you know, we thank healthcare heroes, but we need a little bit more action from people. Well, and it sounds like if we pull that to the most basic first step, it's that you need to ask and you need to listen. And absolutely, listen, even absolutely. if you don't like the answer, or even if the answer is surprising, or oh, it's tough for me as you know, with my mom in this long term care center, it's really tough for me to hear the nurse perspective that they're worried about the safety here. I need to hear that so that I can be part of the solution. Well, what would it look differently? What can I advocate for? And knowing that people are doing the best they can, I'm sure administrators and nurse leaders like yourselves and the individual nurses, they're every, if everyone is doing the best they can, then we need to understand what does the best we can look like right now and what could slightly better look like. Like if we got 1% better today or tomorrow or the next day, what could those things be? But we probably can't figure that out if we don't start from a place of truly listening, even yeah. if we're uncomfortable with the answer. Yeah, I think we I think we need to feel that we have a seat at the table. And I think speaking about nurses as being female dominated. So not just we do have men in nursing, but I think because there it is a highly female dominant industry, there are some there are some, I guess, norms that go with that as well. So females are perceived as being not wanting to speak up. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to, we don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. But I think we have to get beyond that. And I think that what we want is we want other women and other people in in similar industries. So whether it's teachers, whether it's personal support workers, we're all in this together and we all need to stand together and speak out about it. So it's not just for nurses. It's not just for general public. It's for all of the other frontline EMS, all of us. I think we all need to stand together and say, we need much more support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish that there were more nurses that were active um, on social media doing what we're doing. So having a podcast, using that as a platform to advocate for your profession. So, you know, it's, it's something that is not easy to do, but we really feel like it's worth it. And now that um, we kind of are more out there and, you know, being on guests, like being on your channel, I think just getting that message out there and having people hear on a larger scale, what our issues are, the more awareness we can raise then they can stand behind us as well. So I would encourage anybody that wants to get their voice out there just to, just to take that first step. It's, it can be hard at the beginning, but the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be. Yeah, I think people are afraid of, and, and we've heard this many times, Sarah, like nurses are afraid of, one of the things that we've seen is they say, oh, you know, um, if we say anything untowards, we maybe we'll be penalized by our employer, or maybe we'll be looked down upon by the colleges of nurses. And I think that we one of the big messages is that's not true. Unless you're saying something that is blatantly racist or sexist or something along those lines, I think we're we are afraid of things that aren't necessarily the truth. And I think people need to have the ability to feel that it's safe to say to to put a stop to some of the things that we see and just say it's okay to actually say, no, I actually don't agree or or I don't or I perceive this differently. I think we just need to help people have that be able to have that conversation and not be so fearful that there's going to be some retribution. And I think that's a cultural aspect too. I think organizations need to change the way that, that we're perceived. So we don't have, we don't feel fearful to have these powerful and important conversations. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, one of the things that um, I think is a, a great opportunity, and I'm going to say that my speaking profession maybe is feeding into this negativity. It's that we, uh, we, we pit different generations against each other. So it's like all those millennials who are speaking up. Like I know my daughter who's taking history and civics right now, and she's learning about black lives matters and how we've treated indigenous people in Canada and the, the, you know, how long it has taken for women to get to this point where she is as free and has so many opportunities as she does in Canada. And it's just blowing her mind that this, wow, a hundred years ago, women didn't have rights. And, you know, this really, like we have been part of, you know, this, this tragic history, very different than the education I have, I, I have, I can tell you. So it's not surprising that we have a whole generation of more vocal advocates coming out of, out of whether it's nursing school or any in moving into any profession. And one of the quickest ways I have seen in any profession where we squash people's power is we say, we label it and we point our finger and we say, you're a problem. People of your generation, people who are from your area, people who are in your profession. And so, you know, I'm just curious what your experience has been. Do you think that this intergenerational discussion that we're having is helping or hindering the, the voice of, of nurses? Well, I feel like you touched on a lot of really important points. And I think one of, I have to say this, um, with the upcoming election, with seeing a vice president elect, that is not only is she a woman, but she's a woman of color. So she's black and she also has um, roots in India as well. I think for us in our generation, we're seeing that we can mobilize change at at a rapid pace. I think we're seeing that as women too, that these glass ceilings that we're seeing, we can continue to shatter them. So yes, I, I understand where people are saying, oh, those millennials, but it's because we're seeing that rapid change. It's, it's that we're seeing that, hey, you know what? I don't have to not say anything about the way I feel or, hey, I have the opportunity because this person has demonstrated that it's not acceptable. Like watching people who are, not only in roles of power, but showing the way for women, I think is so important. I am so absolutely proud to be called a millennial because I feel that it's important for my voice to be heard. I feel that there's been a long-standing history where women's voices have been um, shadowed or, you know, if you speak up, you are, you're the noisy one, you're the aggressor, or you're called the B word or whatever the case may be. And I think we need to move away from that. We need to say that women aren't, we're, we're not in that century where we're only gonna have kids and be in the kitchen anymore. We're educators, we're entrepreneurs, we're business women. We are in politics, we are in nursing, we are in medicine, we are everywhere. And we are not gonna stop and we're not going to have people tell us that our voices need to be silenced. I'm not going to take it if someone says, hey, you know, you're being loud, you're being aggressive. No, I am being a woman who has the right to say what I am able to say. So I'm okay if they want to call me a millennial. <laughs> like, I'm okay. I'm like, I, hey, I call me a millennial. I, I, I'm ready to say what is important and what needs to be said. And I don't think I should have to fear reprisal or re repercussions because of it. Because it's been too long and I'm ready to start shattering more glass ceilings. Yeah. I'm more than happy to do it. <laughs> it's so important for people to remember that although there was a time when women were given a few options, you could be a teacher, right. you could be a nurse, you could be a mom, like, yes, like, you know, it, the oppression of women was here's your female dominated professions to choose from. When people choose nursing now, it's because this is my vocation. This is my passion. Right. This is not mm -hmm. because I had a limited option. This is because I want, and I choose nursing as opposed to, you know, a Sonatech, you know, doing all the other, you know, there's so many options in healthcare. And so that's, that's really, I think, a thing to honor is that every single nurse in every single um, organization that, that is lucky enough to have nurses they have opted into that profession from a place of choice. Um, and so anyone who kind of has that preconceived notion that this is female dominated because pe people have a limited number of options. No, they choose it willingly and actively and passionately. And we need to help people stay connected to that vocation. Like that's why you chose nursing. 
Absolutely. Yeah, and there's actually like a growing number of people who choose nursing as a second or even a third mm -hmm. career option. So you'll yeah. see uh, older students, I don't want to say older, but not yes. fresh out of high school going into right. nursing because they have gone into other careers and they saw what it was like. And they really want a career where they can make a difference and help people. So they have chosen to go into nursing. And another thing that I don't think the general public is aware of is that nursing does not mean only working at the hospital and only working at the bedside. There are many, many different options for nurses. So for example, you could go into research, you could go into public health, you could start your own business, you could um, you know, help other nurses through coaching or that kind of thing. So, I mean, I'm missing a lot of things here. There's even legal nurse consulting, you know, a lot of different options. So if people are thinking, you know, I don't know if I can handle the shift work or working at the bedside, mm -hmm that is um, okay too, because there are many, many options out there. So nurses are so respected because we do have that frontline experience and that can translate into a lot of different industries, which um, I didn't realize until I stepped out of just nursing at the bedside that we are actually so respected and our knowledge is so valued. Yeah, and I mean, and I think people need to understand, like you said, Sarah, that there are so many opportunities. And I think that, it's, it's okay to work at the bedside too. Like, I know that there's some people that are like, oh, you know, well, I don't want to get my master's degree or I don't want to do that. That's fine too, because we need frontline people. We need people at the bedside, but we also need people who are political, people who are going to push the boundaries, people who are working in other avenues, just to, just to show the public that nurses are more than just these preconceived notions of what they thought they were that nursing has changed and evolved so much over the past hundred years that it's it's not just nightingale's nursing anymore nurses can be seen everywhere and should be in every facet of healthcare as well as other domains because i feel that we have such an important role to play in terms of health in terms of equity in terms of advocacy i think that we should be involved in everything and I love how, you know, we started from the really tough stuff, like what is life like right now in COVID? What is life like before COVID and how challenging it is and how much advocacy is required? And I love how beautifully our conversations evolve to how, how abundant the field of nursing is and mm -hmm. how it is still such a valuable and important career option for people. Don't, you know, you don't have to be scared off of, you know, becoming a nurse because that's one of the things that we hear is people are leaving the profession. Yeah. People, if you're a nurse and your mom was a nurse, she may say, or he may say, um, if it was your dad's a nurse, don't choose nursing, choose something else. So we really want to keep the narrative of, from a place of abundance. There's so, there's so many career options. There's so much reward to it. There's so many good organizations to work with. And if you don't like it there, you can go and work somewhere else. Uh, you can, you don't know, switch the type of nurse. You may start out working in a hospital or home care and decide that may not be for you. You can switch the type of area and the type of nursing that you do. You can specialize, you can, there's so, our careers are long. We're, we're fortunately at a place where we're healthy as Canadians and Americans. So, you know, we can, you can have many, many iterations of your nursing career. So what is your, if we close out, what is your best advice to people whose kids are considering nursing or, you know, you, you're, you're considering nursing, you're watching this, considering nursing, you're leading nurses and you want to be a good mentor and support to them. Uh, you want to help your peers stay in love with nursing. What is your best advice to them? Do you want to start, Sarah? <laughs> um, you know what? I was actually going to start with a story. So my mom was actually a nurse. My mom, um, she, she went to the university of Florida and she did not work as a nurse for long, just the, the situation she was in at the time. And she actually told me not to go into nursing. Well, I did, obviously. And mm. she looks back at the advice she gave me now. And she said, I can't believe I gave you that advice. It was so wrong. You are so lucky that you're in this profession. And I said, well, I don't think it's just luck. I chose to go into it because I felt mm. like it was something I could do a good job at. I was interested in. So she says now, oh, you know, because your situation has changed so much, all these opportunities are available to you. So I think, like you said, nursing has really evolved in the last few decades and it continues to evolve. So if I had advice for anyone that wanted to go into nursing, I would say that you need to just think about everything that we talked about. So the good, the bad, the ugly, um, just go with your gut. If it feels right 
to you that you want to help people, then I think that you can definitely make it work. And um, just think about all the opportunities that are available. I'm sure in 20 years time, there are going to be roles for nurses that we don't even know about right now. Mm -hmm. Things that don't even exist yet that will continue to be there for nurses. And I even think about just in the broader sense of um, automation, right? So a lot of jobs are being taken away by automation, by machines. Well, nursing is not ever going to get there, I don't think. You're mm -hmm. always going to need a nurse. You're going to need someone physically looking after someone else. And so that's mm -hmm. why I feel like even in the long term, it's going to be a career to always, you know, you can always get into it and, and do well. I love it. And thank you for sharing that story. That's that's so great. So great. And, and what about you? What advice? What advice would I have? I mean, I think I always say that research what you're getting yourself into. I think that's really important to know kind of um, what, 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 you, what you might be getting into. And I think it's just important that if you feel that this is your passion, it's your calling, it's probably something that you should do. Um, I think nursing is such an invaluable career. I mean, I am so happy that I, I came, I became a nurse and I feel that this is, I, some people have asked me, and I think maybe this has come to Sarah too, is like, why didn't you become a doctor? Why did you do this? And it's because I wanted to do the duties as a nurse as I as I can, because I feel that the work that nurses do are so important. We are at the bedside. We are with the patient 24-7. We are there caring for them, understanding them, knowing all of the intricacies within their care to be the best person to be there for them. And I always think that that, for me, was one of the most impactful reasons as to why I became a nurse. And I felt that the other thing is nursing continues to evolve. There are so many opportunities. So not only am I a nurse, I'm a mom, I'm a podcaster, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a political activist. You can do so many different things in nursing. And I think people don't realize that there's a, this breath with it. So I encourage and I empower everyone that if nursing is your thing, definitely go for it. Definitely Ooh. apply, get in and do, do the best that you can. And I feel like yeah. Even though I may not be at the bedside now, I'm still helping people, whether it's through having these conversations, whether it's through doing some research and putting out the best type of information for things. Because I, I know that sometimes people can get onto Dr. Google and not get the right information. I feel that um, there's so much more that can be done and I'm happy to continue to do it and have that, those conversations. So Amazing. if you want to be a nurse, you can do it. Yay. And I have one last thing to add. Um, yeah. You could be part of someone's best day of their life and worst day at the same Absolutely. time. I don't know how many other professions you can say that for. So it's really so important. Like when I have patients come back to me years later and say, you know, you were my nurse. And to be honest, I don't remember them all the time, but that's how you can make an impact, right? Mm -hmm. Someone will remember you years to come because you were there holding their hand either on the best day of their life or the worst. Yeah. Absolutely so powerful beautiful oh my gosh that's it i have to retrain i have to retrain <laughs> <laughs> inspired me i love it well i've always loved nurses which is why i i could never you know it's always a great excuse to go to gamba as you say amy you know because i really genuinely wanted to understand uh you know the the experience of the biggest portion of our organization and i'm right. so grateful um, to both of you spending the time with me so that the people watching this um, video could see a window into your worlds, because most of us don't have the privilege and the honor of being able to do that. I think we're more inspired to be able to try to learn more, to ask more concrete, deep questions and be ready for the answer, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as you had said, Sarah. And um, for us to really to, to, to truly authentic authentically, whatever that looks like for us to genuinely appreciate people, um, whether it's sending a card to the department, whether it was yesterday that you received care or, you know, your baby was 20 years ago, send in some appreciation genuinely from the heart. Uh, if you see a nurse, you meet a nurse, tell them what a difference that they make. Um, if you're going to be banging cups, don't just do it when everybody's doing it and it's trending, like really genuinely keep that recognition and appreciation going because it's when nobody's watching. It's when nobody, there's no movement happening, no ha trending hashtag. Your appreciation is when that's really, really matters. And 
don't forget the importance of seeing people in their toughest moments. You just mentioned, Sarah, about you can be part of people's best day and worst day. All of us who aren't nurses, you can also influence people's best day and worst day as a nurse. Somebody's struggling, somebody's feeling burnt out, they haven't had their break, acknowledge that, appreciate them to say, wow, you've been in my room so many times, I'm so grateful for the kind of care you're providing. Wow, you were here the last three days, you must be tired, thank you for your dedication. So find a way to make it personalized, specific and meaningful and never miss an opportunity to thank a nurse, ever. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. 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 Awesome. You, and um, how can folks listen to your podcast and pass it on to people as well? Uh, well, you can just do a Google search for the Grady Nurse. We are everywhere. So we're on Google, uh, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Spotify. You know, just find us there. We're also on social media. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in our apparel line, it's called Grady Nurse Apparel. And you can head on over to gradynurse.com. Awesome. Thanks, ladies. Thank you for your time and thank you for what you do every single day and how you elevate the profession because when you elevate the profession, you elevate the health and well-being of all Canadians. So I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. So exciting. Stop.